Welcome to our service here at the Germantown Church of Christ. So glad you could be with us. Be back from Christmas with family. I know we have some visitors here with family, so we're just happy for you to be here tonight. I want to ask you if you would to stand. We're going to stand for the first couple of songs that we sing. We'll sing the first and last verse of Faith is the Victory. Let's sing together. <clears throat> Encamped along the hills of light, he wished the soldiers ride and rest the land.
Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we're grateful that we could come together this evening as a family, as your family, your children. We're thankful for that honor that you bestow upon us. We're thankful that we can come and sing praises to you and honor you and glorify you and uh, just by all that we do, hopefully all that we do. And Father, we're thankful for your son and we're thankful that uh, all the things he's done for us, especially his going to the cross for us. And we're thankful that so many people around the world think of him at this time of year. And, uh, and we pray with they, that they would think about him more often. But we're just glad they, they still recognize him as somebody very special. And we know how special he really is and we thank you for him. And just ask you to be with us as we're gathered together to encourage each other, to honor you with our songs, and to learn from your word. So give us a good and joyous and honorable time together. In Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand. We sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. <clears throat> Tell me the story of Jesus.
Scripture tonight comes from Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Mike, it's, it's been a great day, hasn't it? We've had a lot of visitors here. It's good, good to come back on them. Well, it's good to come back on a Sunday night and just be able to think together. I don't know how you feel about that, but just thinking together. I love the beauty of brevity. If you think that's a short sermon, well, hope springs eternal, and that might be the case, and that's the hope, at least for me. But I want to tell you a story. Totally unrelated anything in a sermon, but it's a story, and it has a point, should have a point. It's about my car. I drive an old car. I like driving old cars. This is the car I want to hang on to. I've been driving it now. It has over 200,000 miles on it, and I've had it for a while. And here's the problem. It has a squeak. It has many squeaks. Anytime you get in the car, it just squeaks. It's done that for years. It's been embarrassing to drive along, and it's fine. I'll have me listen to the radio. No one hears me. Then you, you notice that people watch you. I've had cars like this before. I thought they were admiring. At one point, I had a Ford Maverick in Little Rock, and I was driving around. I thought, boy, this must be a nice car. I bought it off the preacher at, at the church, Levy Church. And so I, he, his daughter had it, so I bought it from him. And I thought it must be a good car. Everyone's admiring it until I rolled the window down and I could hear squeak, 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 squeak. And I, that's what they were listening to was the squeaking. Well, this has had the same thing. And I decided I can fix this. This is a problem I can deal with. So I got my can of WD-40 and I went below finding the squeak, you know, just I've done that for years. It didn't seem to work. So I finally, after years I, I was talking to him. He said, you know what it is? You've got a bushing underneath there, and that bushing is squeaking, and that's the problem. Okay, I'm going to find that bushing. Where's the bushing? Well, let me tell you how many bushings a car has. It has a lot. So I was doing, it got to the point where I started taking, to get, when I had the oil change, I would say, let, if you'll put it on the rack, let me just take my WD-40, and I have some white lithium grease. Let me get underneath there, and I'm going to, and they, we did. I had everyone. We were all, anything. It sounded like, or it looked like it's on a rack, so you couldn't really do anything with it. So we sprayed it down. Only one time did I get it close, and then when it rained, everything came back. Squeak, 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 squeak. Boy, it was just a squeak, squeak, squeak. Then I got to the point where I said, I am tired, took it into another mechanic, and did the same thing. And they're good men. These are not people, it's just squeak, squeak, squeak. And it just got, I'm, I said, I'm selling the car. That's it, I've had it. Just And I really seriously did look at it. And, at selling it, one person told me, he said, you know what you can do? It might cost you some money, it'd be worth it. Even if you spent $2,000 on it, you, it'd be worth it because what could you buy another one for? And I said, okay, that may be what I need to do. Talk to Charles David one day. And he has a long history in mechanics, working with General Motors. He taught these classes. He said, here's where you need to go. And he told me, I don't want to give a commercial, but I'm telling you, if you need to know, I'll tell you where to go. And I took it down there and I said, here's, I've got a lot of squeaks on this car and I'm told that you can handle it. He said, well, it might cost you a lot of money. I said, well, if you can just let me, I just want to see it. So they didn't put it on the rack. They rolled it over the hole like a Jiffy Lube and that was great. Man came around and he was smiling. He said, come here, I want to show you something. I said, good, I want to see it. I went down there with it. Watch your head. We went down underneath the car, looked at it. He said, see this right up here? There is a little sway bar. And that sway bar is striking the frame. The frame goes the length of the car. And then he pushed it, and it's, there was that squeak, squeak. And I thought, that is it. That's one of them. But there's more, let me tell you. I know that because even when I had the Ainsworth brothers over at our house, Jeremy and Stacy, I had them out in my driveway. And they were bouncing the car, and I was underneath, and I bounced it, and they were underneath. We all tried to get that thing to squeak. He said, see that sway, every time that squeaks, 
that's, that's, the, that's the problem. I said, yeah, but that's just one. I'm telling you, the whole thing squeaks. And another man behind me said, no, I'm telling you, you fix that, you fix them all. And I said, well, I'll, I don't believe you, but that one needs to be fixed. If you can fix that, then we'll start on the others. I'll just bring it back every time. They put a bushing in it. I pulled out on the road and I thought, I'm going to see how many squeaks. There isn't a squeak for a week now. I've been driving with no radio. I just want to hear silence as I'm driving. It is so beautiful. There are a lot of lessons to be learned by that one squeak. I couldn't chase the squeaks. You have to find the source. That would be a good sermon in and of itself. But that's a lengthy way of telling this story. I had a squeak in a car. It fixed the bushing. It fixed the squeak. That's just a brief way of saying that. What I'm telling you is... When you read the Bible, you're reading something beautiful. Not too long ago, I was preaching on Galatians 4, when the time was right. And I mentioned, this is a gross understatement. Listen to this passage. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, that's what you call a compact, rich statement. That's the Bible. I mean, it's just as concise as it can be. You can't pack any more meaning into a small paragraph than Paul did. I was, in, I was so engrossed by that. I couldn't get my mind back on the sermon because I was thinking, that's fascinating to me. That how you can take all of this and get it, just for example, when the fullness of time came. Wow! It's now time when God says, I am going to send my son. I don't know exactly when that time came other than everything that we've been dating is dated back to that time. That's pretty impressive. You'd have a hard time when you say 2021. What's, why is 2021? It's after the birth of Christ. You can call a bank and say, well, we've changed the way we're looking at this. But no, we're still using that date. That's impressive. God sent forth his son. Talk about that a while. There was a conversation in heaven where God is saying, I need to send a redeemer. How do I know that? Colossians chapter 2. When you talk about, had this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. There was a decision made by the son to submit to the will of the father. But he just says, God sent forth his son. That's truncating everything. That to me is so exciting because this Bible that we have is so rich. And it continually does that. That when you read just a small portion, but you start meditating on that and thinking about it, what are you reading? Born of a woman. Women don't have any rights. Oh, read the Bible. Women had a privileged position. Mary is the one that's told, Hail, favored one, the Lord loves you. How can I do this? Same message over here to Zechariah. And Zechariah said, I don't think that can happen. I need a sign. Okay, you won't be able to talk and you won't be able to hear until this happens. That's pretty impressive. But Mary said, how can this happen? And it's explained to her because she is saying how, not if, how. Born under the law in the New Testament. I'm just saying every one of these phrases. So I started doing a little more homework. I started reading. And I read about a man who preached in Kentucky, J.W. McGarvey. And he wrote, and many of his uh, sermons are in print. And in 1890, he was writing a sermon that he had given. It's a lengthy sermon far longer than tonight's will be, but he's talking about how we can know that God is doing something. He's how God works. And he's talking about the beauty of God's word. You have to spend time in his word, read it, but you've got to not just read it, understand where it's coming from. How do you know the Bible is God's word? He said, 
What's impressive about the Bible is there's no attempt to hide the sins of the people, particularly of believers. And he says that ought to impress you. I'm already impressed with the Bible. And we talk about it. Read the Bible, read the Bible. But to many people, that sounds like, oh, I've got to study again. No, be impressed with it. You don't have to read it all. I think everyone ought to read through the Bible. But I have to tell you that if you just take one book and really focus on it a while, even one chapter, even one paragraph, it'll start working on you if you think about it. Because the Bible says so much and so little. We just sang the song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. I didn't know Brian was going to lead that song. But as we were singing, I was saying, this is making the very point. Tell of the cross where they laid him. Tell how he anguished in pain. All of that. Tell the cross where they nailed him. Do you know, did you ever think about this? Here is Luke, the physician. And this is what he says about the burial. Luke, the physician, not the burial, but the crucifixion of Jesus. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. That's it. One verse. Well, what was it like, Luke, if you're a physician for a man to be crucified? I've read that a, a, a doctor or physician looks at the crucifixion. I've read that, oh, it must be a three-page lengthy description. Luke says in one verse what happened. He goes on to more important issues. And then... We're reading about the, we're singing about the temptation of Jesus. And that was the song. Tell me the story of Jesus. And when Matt, Luke tells a story in Luke chapter 4, for 40 days while tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. That's it. Now, I took a story of changing one thing, just one bushing. And made into a diet. This is how it affected me. This is all. And all the Bible is saying is, here it is. Just read this and think about it. I will just throw this in. That's why when someone says, I've read through the Bible every year. I think that's good. It's good to read through the Bible. But what did it say? Did you catch it? Did you catch the spirit of it? It's hard to just read through it. I can't listen to Bible on tapes, never could, because it'll say something and my mind stops and parks and it'll go with that statement. And by the time I get back, it's on to something else. I've missed a whole chapter because my mind is thinking about that event. Well, no attempt to hide the sins of the people, particularly of believers. The Apostle Peter, he's and, and McGarvey does this very well. He says he talks about him at his best. He preaches in Acts chapter 2. No big deal saying Peter got up and preached. Men and brethren, listen to me. Men of Israel, I have something to say. Jesus had told him in Matthew chapter 16, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I think that's what he's talking about. I'm going to let you be the one to introduce this. There's no, Jesus told me back in Caesarea Philippi that I would be, we don't read that. The Bible just says he started talking. This is what happened. This is it. And with the same tone of voice, the Bible also tells us that Peter betrayed him, denied him three times. And in this book, there are no other apostles saying, poor Peter, he was, thinks he was such a great leader. And yet look what he did. That, that doesn't happen. You don't even read of people saying about Judas who betrayed the Lord. Judas was with us, but we never did believe it. You don't read that. It's just simple matter of fact. Statement of facts, extreme calmness of the descriptions of each of the events, which is terrifically understated. And I want to hurry there and then quit. But then the unexpected brevity of the New Testament narratives. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You don't even have to open your Bibles. Matthew chapter three. Think of what's happening. Here is Jesus is talking and what Matthew is recording as he's telling this story is about the baptism of Jesus. Verse 13. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. 
than he permitted him. And after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Matthew just goes right on. I want to say, whoa, this is why I can't get by this. Whoa, wait a minute. Did you hear what he just said? Jesus makes a trip to find John the Baptist. This is the guy, you remember how he was dressed? You remember what he ate? You remember what he said? Do you remember what he was getting into? We could, if we're not careful, we can start making up facts as we start telling the story. But the Bible just says this is what happened. This is it. John says, not me. I'm not worthy. No, we want to fulfill all righteousness. I want to participate in this righteous act. And you're the one I want to do it. Wow. And apparently John the Baptist was impressed enough with this. This is to do all that is right before God. I want to be baptized. After being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open. He saw the spirit of God. He came down in the form of a dove. It's not really a dove, just in the form of a dove. Well, that's what Luke tells us. It was in the form of a dove. In Luke says in bodily form. I'm just saying what the Bible says is so brief. I think it was a dove. I think the Holy Spirit was represented by that dove, but it was a dove. You can say it was just look, it was just an apparition. No, it was a dove. And that's and if we were arguing, we'd get an argument over that, wouldn't we? I've heard people argue about that. I'm not arguing about that. I'm just saying the Holy Spirit was there and represent. John saw it. That impressed him coming upon him. And then of all things, a voice comes from heaven. God speaks three times in the New Testament about this with this uh, three times when he's this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased he'll say it another time you listen to him listen to him but this one this is my beloved son we haven't heard from God speaking if if I'm right you can find if I'm wrong all the way back to Mount Sinai when God speaks from the mountain that goes back a long way but here is God speaking so that everyone can hear him this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and the Bible just speaks in such hushed tones, highly understated. Well, what does that mean? Well, it simply means that when I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading a rich resource. Here's another one. I'll just do three of these. This is the second one. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 7 is Luke the historian and what a great historian telling us about Stephen defending himself and then he is put to death well chapter 8 verse 1 begins with a statement that probably should have been with Acts chapter 7 but man divided up the chapters Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death the text says hearty agreement now, I have to stop and think when I'm reading this, if I'm reading a story and I go back to Paul, what do I know about Paul? Paul was such a great guy. He's the one we brag about. He's the one we preach about. We quote Paul. Why shouldn't we? He had this great task of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. I'm thankful for that. And then when Saul was holding the garments of those who were stoning Stephen, there were people watching him. I mean, you could go on and on with the story, but listen, listen how briefly it's stated by Luke. On that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Therefore, verse four starts off, therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. 
You talk about understatement. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The church had its beginning in Jerusalem. 3,000 are baptized. Keep reading there, 5,000 men, not including women. All of those people coming to the Lord. Saul comes in here and he starts ravaging the church. What did he do? He's going house to house. This is a man that is possessed. What is he possessed with? He is a possessed with the love of God and a dedication to his will. And he thought all of those supposed Christians were ludicrous and going against the will of God. It's going to take something to get Saul started. But boy, he began ravaging the church and dragging them off and putting them in prison. It is no wonder when he has his Damascus Road appearance later and he comes back and tries to associate with them at Jerusalem. They're not having anything. No, you're not coming in here. We know what you did. And it's Barnabas that stands. I mean, those are stories we could tell, couldn't we? But that's not what Luke does. Luke just says that's what happened. And you know what happened? People started preaching the word everywhere they went. Something good can happen out of it. Now, one of the things that I have a hard time doing is trying to interpret events. Some people have no qualms in saying exactly what God is doing. I just don't share their insight. I don't have that ability to know. All I know is if we keep doing what is right, God is going to bless us and God is going to use us. But we say, God did this. I don't know. Did God cause a flood to happen in New Orleans back when the hurricane Katrina hit? I was in Ukraine at the time, and that's what people were talking about as you're watching the news over there. Here they are talking about, did God have something to do with causing a hurricane to punish a city that was filled with sin? If that's the case, we all better watch out. If God is going to take retribution against everyone that sins, every one of us stands in great peril. But I don't think he was doing that. What I do know is that God uses things. And maybe, maybe later we'll find out what God was doing if he caused it. But of course, we live in a natural world where things happen. So a pandemic. What is God doing with a pandemic? Well, I've heard everyone say everything. I, 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 I understand what they're saying. I just don't necessarily agree. All I know is you stay with the God. Stay with his word. Stay with his will. Whatever happens, God can handle it. And that's what this text to me says. He's just saying this is what happens. Now, here's one with a little different twist in Romans chapter 11 that was just read for us. And I appreciate being read. Here is Paul giving his letter to a church that he'd never even visited. He knew many people there if you read the last part of it. But he writes his letter and some, some have called this the gospel of grace because it's so beautifully pictures what God is doing through his people. And it's, it's a wonderful, it's a very challenging letter to read and understand, but it's good. But I want you to notice this. It's the one time when Paul pauses instead of acting. I tried to tell that story about my car as vividly as I could, because I want you to understand how aggravating it was to get in a car and just, wee, 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 wee. I went to the, it really hit the, the, the rid of really hit me was I went to the airport to pick up uh, Bob and Joy Straw coming in from Texas. And so when I was driving up there, there were a line of people, they're all waiting for their cars and you, there are little speed bumps there. Let me tell you what happens when you hit a speed. And they all looked at me. I felt like if you ever want to feel like an old man, just drive around in a car when it's just bad. I said, this is it. That's it. I tried to get as vivid as I could. The Bible does just the opposite. But on occasion, on occasion, there are times when as one writer says about Romans 11, verse 33, that Paul just breaks out in praise. And this is one of those times when he just stops and he breaks out in praise. In Romans chapter 11, verse 33, beginning. Let me find this in my text because I can't read from a screen. I need to read it from my text. Oh, the depth of the riches 
both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Now, he's just explained how first the Jews received the plan of salvation, and then that was made available to the Gentiles. He's trying to bring Jews and Gentiles together. And you could say that's the way it is. We're trying to bring everyone together in Christ, whatever the ethnicity. I'm not talking about just having social justice. I'm talking about having God rule. Everyone is under God. We are all level at the foot of the cross. There isn't one of us better than any other person in this world. We're all the same. We have different beginnings, different issues, all that, but we're still all in the same plane. God loves you just as much as he loves me. And we are brothers and sisters if we are in Christ. And that thought hits Paul so that he says, not just the riches of God. He doesn't say that. The depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. When you think of the riches, you think of the inexhaustible resources. Inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. God can create it anytime he needs it. It's available to him. Money doesn't matter to God. Money is a tool. I'm not talking about printing money and just do I'm, I know we could argue about that if we wanted to. No, we're talking about God who creates everything of the wisdom, the designs and the means, the wisdom and the knowledge of, of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Incomprehensible, unfathomable. You can't trace it. You know, here's one way you think of it. When a bird flies, you can't trace where he's going to go. You can't trace where he's been. That is, if you're just looking at it. Now, if I'm watching a train go down Poplar, and this has to be the most popular train track in all the world, I think. This is the I-40 of trains right here. I mean, every time I come by, it's something there. But, boy, you, you know where it's been, and you know where it's going. It was the first joke I can ever remember my dad telling me when I was little and I was trying to learn how to joke. He'd say, a train just came through here. How'd he tell? Well, he left his tracks. And I laughed and I thought, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's, I didn't know my dad could tell jokes. Well, that was his attempt at a joke. Well, you can tell where a train's going, but with a bird, that bird just flies. It's untraceable. It's unfathomable what God is doing. You can't trace it. You don't know, except he's told us what he wants and what he's going to do. It's like you get in line because everyone in this line is going to be blessed. If God told you that, would you get in that line? I'd get in that line. You need to be in this line to go. I mentioned being in a Titans game. I was searching for lines to get in concession stand. Asking, are you in line? Are you in line? When someone said, no, I'm not in line. They're in line. I'm right behind them. I'm now in line. Why? I want to go to where that concession is. If God says, this is what you do, you know what I do. Some people say, I don't know why. I don't think I need to be in this line. If you're not in line, you're not getting where you want to go. Why question God? And that's what he is saying. Verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord? He's quoting from Isaiah 40. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? I've heard people say, I just don't think God cares about. It. Well, wait a minute. Did God say anything? If he said something about it, he cares about it. If he told me how to act and how to live, he cares. I need to do it. Well, then he says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. From him as our creator and the one through him is our sustainer and to him is our judge do you know what that sounds awfully lot like an awful lot like paul's sermon in acts chapter 17 when he was talking to the gentiles in athens and he was saying god is our creator he is our sustainer and our judge that seems to be a theme for paul all the way through he knows what he is doing to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I look at that text and that's what I get. I guess there's beauty and brevity. 
You don't have to preach for a long time to try to, you don't have to preach as long as I did to try to make the same point. But what I would like you to see is there's something about this that's very important. It's beauty of brevity in our time has become a detraction from its usefulness. Here's what I want to say. If you say, well, the Bible doesn't say that's wrong. If you say that, think again. The Bible may have said something about what God desires. And if the Bible says what God desires, that's what he's wanting. There are two ways of looking at that. The Bible teaches principles. We apply them to our lives. The Bible didn't say anything. Well, the Bible has told you what is right. Go with what is right. And it's beautiful in how God empowers us to understand what he has said. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we do praise you for your omniscience. For you know everything. We're thankful for your power. You are all powerful. We know that you are always present. We understand that you are a spirit. We understand that you live in us. The Holy Spirit living in us represents you and the Son. And Father, we are mindful of your word that's been given to us. We have great respect for it. And we understand that you know things that we don't even have an idea about, but you know what we need and you have provided everything that we need in life. We know that we're weak. We know that we stray often. Help us not to stray far. Help us to come back when we do stray. We know that we're human. And sometimes we don't get along with each other. We pray that we will that we will repent when we're wrong, that we will confess when we've made mistakes because we make them often. I make them often. We pray that you'll bless us all as we serve as your church, your body, your kingdom. We're thankful that you have a place prepared for us. And even though we don't know the specifics, we do know that you've told us you'll be there and that's enough for us. So, Father, we pray that you'll bless us as we read, as we study, as we reflect, as we meditate, as we apply, and then help us to live out those aspirations that we have to be pleasing to you. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight, if you need help in your spiritual walk, we'd love to help you. If we can help in any way, would you come while we stand together and sing? Vanity and pride
code? This morning, first of all, the QR code should be on the screen. If it's not, then you probably have it in a bulletin or somewhere near you, or fill out, if you're here, fill out an attendance card. If you're at home, we'd still like you to fill out the QR code. I think you can do it on Sunday nights. I'm almost certain you can. We do have many more that are involved with uh, sickness. I mentioned that this morning, and it just seems like we have more. Uh, at least in our personal family in Middle Tennessee, we have many that are getting that are sick and i have a nephew in the hospital and uh, with covid and we're praying for him he's a uh, coach in a high school and the teacher is not married so he's uh older but he's he just needs the, the help that he's getting so there are many in this congregation please remember them and even pray for those that you don't know about i mentioned this morning that we wanted to remember carrie kaufman in the passing of her father i learned later that actually he passed away on November the 22nd. They've already had a celebration service. I didn't know that at the time. But if we could remember James and Carrie and Mason and Maddie um, Kaufman, as he had a short bout with cancer and then passed away. And so we want to remember them. Also, today is the last day the elders have asked for our special contributions on giving to those who are storm victims, flood victims, both in Waverly or in Kentucky. I think principally, initially it was geared toward Waverly. I don't know what will happen as we learn more about the needs around, but that will be an ongoing event, I'm sure, as we have needs. This church has always been very generous and we appreciate Jerry Ellis and others who are working with him and kind of marshalling that together for us. But this is the last day, if you are interested in giving and you didn't, you could write out a check and in the notation, if you could just put for the disaster relief, that would be good. This next Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, we won't have Bible classes. We have great Bible classes going, uh, but because everyone is traveling and we have many who are out of town traveling and being with family, isn't that great? Some are just traveling and we have uh, other visitors that are here. We had visitors this morning that I haven't seen. We had some today, tonight that I haven't seen in 20 years, I don't think, but they're coming in. In fact, uh, John Galloway and his wife Eileen were here. They came specifically. He said, yeah, we went to college together. Well, I didn't actually didn't remember that, but he had a full mask on. So in all honesty, I couldn't have recognized him anyway. But uh, they serve in Glasgow, Scotland, and as missionaries and have been there for 25 or more years. They came specifically to find Philip and Pat Slate. They wanted to visit with them and just catch up. He's a, a preacher, missionary, and Bible class teacher. And they met at Free Harvin, then went back to Scotland to work. It was fascinating to see a lot of different people. So when people say, you don't get anything out of coming, listen, let me tell you some of the things you do get. Just being able to be together tonight is wonderful. Thank you for coming. I hope you don't rush off. We'd like to just at least visit, fellowship a little bit, share our stories, and be committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. That's what this church is all about. Appreciate your being here. As we have a closing song and a closing prayer, the Lord's Supper is prepared for those who have not had the opportunity today to partake of, and while we're singing and praying, you can go right out here to the fellowship hall and you will be served. Let's stand and sing together. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify
thank you so much for the great opportunity we've had to be here tonight to study your word and give you all honor and glory. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us each day, but most of all for your son Jesus and his love. Father, thank you for all the things that you do for us. Pray, Father, you'll continue to be with us. We pray that we leave from here this evening, that we'll take the things that we heard this morning and this evening to share with others that we come in contact with. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 